child it was in me. Chris Regan went missing in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This is a story that may as well be right out of a TV crime procedural. I was Kelly admitted to having an affair with Regan. I believe we The Cochran's invited the sailors for a barbecue. Kelly Cochran trial. 34-year-old woman accused of murdering an iron river man. Then, with her help dismembered, she even led investigators to where they dumped the remains. Oh, that if he would have never met me, he'd be here today. Hello there, my true crime cult. It's Breland here. I'm gonna be telling you a really wild story. This true crime story is gonna make you think twice before you eat at that barbecue this summer. Subscribe if you'd like to become part of the true crime cult. Thursday is the day that I'm gonna be posting all of my new true crime videos. So even if you don't get notified, just come back here every Thursday. Also wanted to let you know I have a merch store if you're interested. I have this shirt right here. I'm gonna link that shirt below. I sell my shirts on Etsy. They're really high quality and not only that, I'm gonna give you a discount code as well. So you can find all of that in the description. So make sure you give this video a like. It's a free way that you can help your girl out, okay? But really, like it. I'm gonna do my best to include the most important facts because there's a lot of them. So I'm just gonna tell you what you need to know when it comes to following this case. So the star of this entire video, which I'm sure if she knew she was the star of this video, she would absolutely be overjoyed because she's incredibly narcissistic. Her name is Kelly Marie Cochran Gaboyan. Gaboyan is her maiden name and she was born in Maryville, Indiana on June the 5th, 1982 to her really sweet parents, Melanie and Tim Gaboyan. Kelly was born into a really down-to-earth type atmosphere. She was born in Maryville, Indiana, which is a rather small town, but it's also around an hour from Chicago, which is pretty awesome. It was described that they owned a house with lots of animals. I don't really know much else about her childhood. She had a good, clean upbringing. So out of all three Gaboyan siblings, Kelly was the oldest. As a teenager, Kelly became quite rebellious. She was very wild. She got pretty bored of the farm life really quick. She started rebelling and just getting into all kinds of trouble. As a teenager, Kelly was a huge fan of substances. And this is something that really drove a wedge between her and her family life. Like her mom at one point would not even let Kelly come home unless she had had a clean substance test, and she even tested her. So Kelly's parents have actually been together for over 40 years. So she knew that when she got married, it was gonna be for life. That's just the way it was, and that's the way she was raised. As Kelly grew into an adult, she was constantly getting into trouble because of the substances that she would consume, and she was actually put into several detention centers. She served time in juvenile hall. She actually lived next door to a boy whose name was Jason Cochran. Jason Cochran was the boy next door as Kelly described him. He was a very quiet, laid back kind of guy and Kelly never knew life without him. They literally grew up together, right next door, their entire lives. Kelly and Jason had also experimented with different substances together when they were a bit younger, and they kind of just always felt comfortable around each other, so I totally get why they would start a relationship 
So Kelly and Jason both graduated high school in the year of 2000 and went to Purdue University as far as college goes. They both went there and this is really where their romance began to flourish. After college, Jason asked Kelly to marry him and Kelly said yes, of course, but her family was really confused because they knew Jason as like this really laid back, chill kind of dude, like cool dude in a loose mood kind of thing. And Kelly was just so wild. They were total opposites. Some family members, including Kelly's brother Colt, even described their relationship as like oil and water. That's how opposite they were of one another. But as they say, opposites attract. And they went ahead and went through with getting married in 2002. After Jason and Kelly were married, that very night on their honeymoon, they made a blood oath to one another. If one or the other ever takes a lover and is ever in any extramarital affairs, if Jason takes a lover, that gives Kelly the right to unalive the lover. If Kelly takes a lover, that gives Jason the right to unalive her lover. And they went on with their marriage. So after they were married, they had a really basic type of marriage. It was like a team effort, I guess. Both of them worked. Jason and Kelly worked together because they actually started a business where they cleaned pools, they serviced pools, and they also did occasional landscaping. Unfortunately, Jason had a really bad back and after 10 years of working at this business nonstop, it was time for him to retire from the lawn and garden slash pool business because his back was done, according to him. At this point, Jason and Kelly agreed to have Jason stay home and rest. Since he had worked so many years, he deserves to have some time to rest for a while, and Kelly would go out and help pay the bills and take care of the household financially. So Kelly managed to line up a job at a factory in Iron River, Michigan, which is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's cold, snowy in the winter, but it's also very beautiful, lots of outdoorsy things to do, nothing like their small Indiana town, and they were excited for this fresh new start. She started working at a factory called Lakeshore Systems. So Lakeshore Systems manufactures parts for Navy ships and the marine defense industry. Kelly excelled at this job. She was a really good employee and things were looking up for Kelly and Jason. Jason got settled into the home life of taking care of the house, making sure that dinner was cooked when Kelly got home. He was stepping up as much as he possibly could and same goes for Kelly. Another reason why Jason and Kelly really wanted to move to Michigan was because Jason smoked marijuana and he needed a medical marijuana card and for some reason in Indiana he wasn't able to get it legally and he wanted medical marijuana because of his back pain and it was the only thing that he truly could count on to take it away besides like really harder type pain medication like opioids. So now that Kelly was head of household, she had all the control now. She was bringing home the money, she was paying the bills, and that's exactly how Kelly liked it. I feel like this just fed into her narcissism even more, and she felt like she could literally do whatever she wanted. She had it all. She had a house husband who took care of her and made her dinner every night. She had this new job and she was making new friends and really just settling into this new life. And she was on top of the world at this point. Some of his friends even described Jason as seeming like he was kind of scared of Kelly. Like, he didn't want to piss her off ever. There was actually this incident one of Jason's friends described where they were playing an online game together. Jason said, Kelly's home, and then immediately just cut it off. He didn't even say goodbye to his friend. He dropped everything that he was doing and didn't even speak to his friend again until the next day. It's like, as soon as Kelly got home, he had to put all of his attention onto her, which is also a narcissistic personality trait, is to always feel as though you should be the center of attention. 
I don't even want to know what she was like behind closed doors to make him this way. I'm sure she was very overbearing and extremely controlling. As I said before, Jason always wanted to keep Kelly happy, whether it be mentally, physically, sensually. So when Kelly brought up the fact that she wanted to open their marriage, Jason reluctantly agreed. So another reason why Kelly wanted to open her and Jason's marriage was because Jason really couldn't move the way that he moved in the past. Especially with his back issues, it made him almost immobile. So that's why Kelly was seeking lovers elsewhere. I feel like that was just an excuse to be able to cheat. Let's be real here. It's like he was so scared to say no to Kelly. And therefore, they opened their marriage and now they were allowed to take lovers. Of course, Jason wasn't exactly the one looking for lovers. It was actually Kelly. And she had multiple lovers, including men and women. Because Kelly was going out and being sensual and intimate with anybody and everybody she possibly could, besides her husband sitting at home with the dog. He was becoming really resentful and upset. Some friends describe like the text messages between them to be out of character for Jason. He doesn't typically act that way or express himself in an angry way. And he expressed how jealous he was at all of these extramarital affairs that she was having. And I don't think he ever had an affair. He may have, but it wasn't really in any articles. Like, he never really had any lovers. So Jason also struggled with extreme depression. His depression got worse and worse the more she would essentially cheat on him and he would just kind of look the other way, the more depressed he got. He even got to a point to where he was sua idol and he had to be put in an institution because of this, and he spent some time away in an institution to get himself better. So he did eventually get better, but he still wasn't cool with the fact that she wanted to be with other people. So now let's move on to this portion of the story, which is about Christopher Regan. Chris was a 53-year-old U.S. vet who was originally from Detroit, Michigan, and he actually moved to Iron River to work at the same company that Kelly worked at. He was a really good-looking guy for his age, and of course, Kelly noticed him. As soon as she saw him, she pounced on him like he was the last man on earth. They actually started to have an affair and it was strictly an intimate affair. There was no relationship to it, but regardless, she got the man and she didn't have to sleep with her husband anymore. So I also wanted to mention Chris Regan's ex-girlfriend, Terry O'Connell. She played a big role in this story. Him and Terry had a relationship actually back in high school. Chris and Terry had actually rekindled their affair. And shortly after that, it just didn't work out like it did in high school. Mostly because Chris had a prawn addiction. He really loved intimate videos and photos. And Terry was not cool with that. She was like, mm-mm. And she also said that he had expressed to her that since, you know, he was a recently divorced guy, so was Terry O'Connell, he still wanted to play the field. He wanted to have more intimate relationships with other women. Although this ended their intimate relationship, they still stayed friends. And they also kept in touch daily. Like, they were really good friends. Kelly and Chris started to get hot and heavy. Gossip spread around the office that they were having an affair. They would always, like, go out on lunch breaks together. And they were always, like, cozied up with one another. So, of course, the whole office was a buzz-in. Kelly would always go to Chris's place where they would hook up up and nothing more. There really wasn't much to their relationship besides the intimate aspect. It's said that Jason did know about Chris, but he just looked the other way. 
and he was incredibly jealous of Chris. So eventually the affair between Kelly and Chris Regan kind of cooled off a bit. Therefore, Chris decided that he also didn't like working at this company anymore like Shore Systems. He mentioned that it was just not working out. He didn't like the actual job that he was doing. He looked elsewhere for work and he actually found a job in Asheville, North Carolina. His ex-girlfriend Terry O'Connell offered to help him pack and move and it's also stated by Terry that they were even talking about rekindling their relationship and maybe giving it another try. The day before he was going to leave to Asheville, Kelly gives Chris a call. And I wanted to mention Kelly was not cool with Chris leaving. He was leaving her in the dust and she was not okay with that. Kelly gives Chris a call and says, hey, you're leaving, you know. I want you to come over and I'll cook you a goodbye meal. I'll make you some lasagna. There may be some dessert in it for you at the end of the meal. And of course, being the hyper intimate man that he is, he agreed. So Jason actually had an extreme hatred for Chris at this point. He was jealous of him because obviously Chris had something that he didn't. Therefore, since Jason hated Chris, he reminded Kelly of the blood oath that they took on the night of their wedding. That's when her husband Jason strongly insisting on taking Chris out. Kelly later states she was forced. I mean, obviously she wasn't forced, but she was forced emotionally by Jason to partake in this. She really liked Chris. She even described him as the most wonderful thing in her life at the time. Her husband Jason wanted to take that from her, but because of the blood oath they made, she went through with it. She honored it. So on the evening of October 14th, 2014, Christopher Regan and Terry O'Connell were at his place and Terry was helping him pack up the rest of his things. And he told Terry that since he's leaving tomorrow, he was going to let her know and they could get together and he could say goodbye to her before he left for Asheville. So she was expecting to hear from him the next day. Remember how I said they would only go to Chris's place? Well, Kelly was inviting Chris over to Kelly and her husband Jason's place. He even had to get directions from Kelly because he had never been there before. So Kelly lured Chris over to her house that day with lasagna and dessert. And unfortunately, when he got there, he was met with his end. What's even more fucked up is how it went down. So Kelly invited Chris in and she cooked him dinner. Like she actually cooked him lasagna. They sat and they talked. They ate. And eventually it led to intimacy. As they were being intimate, neither one of them had clothes on. Chris had his back turned to the living room and Kelly was against the wall getting railed basically. As Kelly and Chris were in the throes of romantic bliss, Kelly knew what was about to go down and she made sure that Chris was in the exact perfect spot at the right time. And slowly, Jason crept behind Chris out from the living room. Remember I told you Chris had his back to the living room. So Chris had no idea he was about to be ambushed. But Kelly could see Jason coming with the weapon. So this was a shot run that he was using. He put it directly towards his skull and he fired. And his head exploded. Internal matter went everywhere. Detectives later stated that Kelly would have been drenched. Same with Jason. That's how powerful this 22 caliber was. After Jason saw what he had done, they confirmed that he was gone or no longer alive and Jason proceeded to drag his mutilated corpse down into this creepy ass basement and he throws the poor guy on the floor. I'm pretty sure he's missing half if not all of his head. 
he grabs an electric saw. As Jason proceeds to use this electric saw to begin sawing off all of Chris's limbs and dismembering him, he runs into a little snag, so Kelly has to run to the store. So she just runs to Home Depot in the middle of dismembering this poor guy. Once Jason got the cord he needed, he was able to continue his task and he took some trash bags and him and Kelly started loading Chris up into these trash bags. Kelly said that she actually threw up after this whole thing and when she saw that Jason was sawing her lover up. Kelly states that she really cared about Chris, but she still proceeded with this plan that they put in place. I feel like she just liked the way Chris made her feel because of course everything is about her. She's a narcissist. I think that's what she truly cared about more than Chris himself as a person. After getting Chris put away in multiple garbage bags, both Kelly and Jason began the cleaning process, which might I add, they didn't do a very good job. So they ended up disposing of Chris's remains off the Pentoga Trail in Iron County, which is still in Iron River. I believe it's on the outskirts. It's in a more secluded area. They disposed of him in multiple places. Like, so much that they haven't even found all of him. Now that Chris has been disposed of, I assume that... The reason that they can't find all of Chris is because Kelly and Jason hatched up a plan to dispose of him in another way. And this is all speculation, but it's very, very, very likely they did this. Neighbors later pinpointed this as being two days after October 14th, so this would be October 16th. This was two days after they had taken Chris's life and the neighbors said they got a very hospitable invitation to a barbecue in the fall in the freezing cold snow of Michigan, which I find to be very sus. Usually here in the United States, we only have barbecues like in the summertime, it's like a very big summertime event. So yeah, Jason and Kelly were feeling extremely hospitable after they disposed of Chris. And they sent out invitations and invited all of their friends in the neighborhood to come over for a nice old fashioned barbecue. The Cochran's invited the sailors for a barbecue. Neighbors stated that Kelly and Jason had never invited them over for a barbecue before and they never invited them over after, either. Never invited us before and any time after they... So, neighbors and witnesses, friends who went to this barbecue, they said that they noticed Kelly and Jason cooking a lot of meat. And they said this looked like $300 worth of meat. And it's like, Kelly and Jason were not well off whatsoever. So, like, how could they afford this meat? There's like $150, $200 worth of meat just alone. The neighbors claimed they had never tried this sort of meat. It tasted really weird and they asked Jason. Jason lied to them and said that back in Indiana, he was a butcher in exotic meats. That's why their burgers tasted really weird. Jason claimed he was a butcher back in Indiana who specialized in exotic meats. You and I both know Jason never worked as a butcher. The only thing Kelly and Jason did back in Indiana was substances and mowing grass. So now I'm going to roll a clip of David Saylor, who was one of their neighbors who attended this barbecue. Well, it was definitely something I never ate before. It was like a transparent kind of like meat, like a lobster or a shrimp, and it had the texture of it. Like, the, you know, the soft firmness of it. It was like something I never had. When I realized that I might have ate the dude, I didn't want to believe it. My eating habits are gone. I don't eat 
I lost so much weight. So remember how I said Terry O'Connell, Chris Regan's ex-girlfriend, was helping him move? Being an ex-girlfriend and possibly a future girlfriend, she was really smitten with him still. Terry was extremely concerned when Chris never contacted her after October 14th. And she talked to her friends and her friends were like, maybe he just went ahead and went to Asheville, North Carolina and just didn't say anything to you. So Terry eventually hit her breaking point and she was not going to stay quiet anymore after the 10th day of not hearing from Chris. So she went to the Iron County Police Department and filed a missing persons report. As they started the investigation into Chris Regan's missing person case, the investigators actually found his car parked at the place where they disposed of him. And it was really suspicious because they found the directions that Kelly had given him in his car written on a piece of paper. This definitely pointed to Kelly in the end. So it had already been a pretty long time since Chris Regan had gone missing. Detectives knew they did it deep down, but they had no evidence to make an arrest or charge them with anything. At this point, the case went cold and Kelly and Jason were done with the police in Iron River. So they fled back to Indiana and they went back to their hometown. Although Kelly Kelly and Jason had moved back to Indiana, police were still questioning them and harassing them, as Kelly had said. She was starting to get really paranoid because in the interrogation room at one point, Jason seemed as though he was starting to crack and he was starting to give a little bit too much information and Kelly was not cool with that. And therefore, on the day of February 20th, 2016, 911 dispatch received a call from Kelly Cochran stating that her husband was not breathing and she needed an ambulance immediately. Wayne County 911, this, this is like, well, he's breathing barely. I don't know what's wrong, he's throwing up, he's sweating. I need an ambulance right away. She said he wasn't breathing and she also blamed that they were doing substances and this is the reason for him not breathing. So when ambulances arrived, they rushed to Jason's aid and unfortunately he wasn't able to be resuscitated and therefore passed away on that day. So the lead detectives on the Chris Regan case, they did find out that Jason passed away, but they didn't think anything of it. At the hospital, they said he passed away of overdosing on substances, but later the coroner came back and alerted the authorities that he in fact didn't die of substances. He actually died of suffocation. And when they heard that at the Iron River Police Department, they were like, oh my gosh, this is the break we needed. This cold case can be solved. So since detectives had everything they needed to issue a warrant for Kelly's arrest, Kelly had actually fled to Kentucky, but they were able to catch up with her in Kentucky and apprehend her. That's where they brought her back to the police station and interrogated her, where she later confessed to everything. Start from the beginning. He, he comes in the house. What, what happens? Okay. Then what? Chris. He dragged up into the middle of the basement. I started hearing the song. So you put him in the bag. That he goes out there and carries Chris Reagan's remains out there. After Kelly's confession and description of what happened with Chris Regan, she later confessed to the offing of her own husband, Jason Cochran, and admitted how and why she did it. She actually shot Jason up with this substance as he was vomiting from the overdose. She just conveniently put her hands over his mouth and nose and held it until he stopped breathing. That's when she called 911 and faked the whole thing. Kelly later admitted that the reason she took Jason out was because he forced her to get rid of Chris. And Chris was the only wonderful thing in my life, as she said. And this was definitely revenge for forcing her to get rid of her man toy. She said she despised Jason at that point and she leveled the playing field 
They were able to charge her with Chris's offing along with her husband Jason's offing. So on May 10th, 2017, Kelly was sentenced to life in prison for Chris's offing. And on April 18th, 2018, Kelly pled guilty to first degree offing of her husband Jason, which carries a 65 year sentence. So after her sentence, detectives still continued to pry at her and ask like, okay, you've already been sentenced, you know, you're never getting out at this point. Can you show us where Chris's remains are? She cut a deal with them, I think, so she could avoid the offing penalty. She went with detectives to show them where they disposed of Chris's remains. They were able to find a part of Chris's remains, including some bones, and one of the biggest things they found was his skull. And there in his skull was a huge hole from a 22 caliber. Chris Regan's ex-girlfriend, Terry, was devastated, but she was really glad she was able to help lay him to rest and do her part. And I also forgot to mention that Chris had two children. He had two sons. And these monsters, Kelly and Jason, took away a huge part of a family's life, someone's father. And I'm just glad that they were able to justify him and get as much justice as they could. So that's the full story, but there's still a little bit more to it. This all came out a little later in the story after Kelly's been sitting on it for so long. It seems as though because she's a huge narcissist, she just wants this notoriety. So Kelly actually admitted to having other friends buried in Indiana, Michigan, Tennessee, and Minnesota. However, the identities and specific locations of these bodies remain a mystery to this day. So therefore, that makes Kelly a serial offer. I totally believe that this wasn't Jason and Kelly's first rodeo when it come to taking out a lover. As of now, she has admitted to taking people out, but she refuses to admit who they are. So last, an update on where Kelly Marie Cochran is today. As of 2022, Kelly Cochran is 39 years old and she's currently serving her sentence at Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Pittsfield Charter Township, Michigan. That's a very long name. So let me know in the comments if you've seen the documentary called Dead North. It's all about this case. It actually came out, I believe, in January of this year. This documentary really talks about the whole barbecue thing. And let me know below, do you think she fed Chris Regan's remains to the entire neighborhood. It's very sus since this was only two days after Chris Regan went missing. So rest in peace to Chris Regan, my condolences to his family, and I guess rest in peace to Jason Cochran. Although he was also an accomplice, he ended up being a victim of his own wife in the end. Last, I want to leave you with a very disturbing fact about Kelly Cochran. I don't know if you've noticed the amount of butterfly tattoos she has tattooed all over her arms and her body. I have 14 butterfly tattoos that are symbolic to people I've lost. Detectives speculate that these butterflies actually represent all of Kelly Cochran's victims. I believe that those butterflies that are tattooed on her body represent victims. From the very first time I came in here to do search warrants, we were amazed at the amount of butterflies everywhere and what the significance of those butterflies was, which we would much later find out that had a great deal of significance. So I thank y'all all so much for watching. Make sure you're here next Thursday for yet another video. Subscribe if you want to see more. So I thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on Thursday. Bye. Let me ask you something. Yes. Other bodies. Yes. Where are the other bodies? Indiana, Michigan, Tennessee, Brendan, Minnesota. How did he die? I don't know. God, give me a break. Can we do this another time? Be nice. <laughs>
You know that's not in my DNA. <laughs> of a 10-year-old girl, Lily Peters. Peters was found murdered near a popular trail just days ago. She got on her bike to go home, but she never made it there.